Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jan Leary, and I'd like to welcome you to the Truth Zone. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning into the Truth Zone. And today we have with us Sharon McGuire. She has been on the Truth Zone actually before. I think it was about a year or so ago. Uh, but today she's joining us because um, we're doing something pretty serious. I know a lot of you have probably heard about the growing epidemic of drugs that are being used on the Cape. And um, I've checked with the police department, with doctors, and of course it's all over the newspaper about what's been happening, and it's really sad. Uh, I spoke with a police officer from the Dennis Police Department, and he was saying that it's very hard to detail how many overdoses there are now, how many people are actually taking drugs, because they have since uh, given people the ability to get Narcan, which is a drug that actually reverses an overdose. So uh, it is available on the Cape, and since it's available, they don't have any way of really detailing what is actually happening, you know, with the drug addiction. But the reason I had Sharon come is because there is a hope, even though, you know, um, people are saddled in a mire of this drug addiction, there is a hope out there. So I was going to ask you, Sharon, why do you really think the people are today doing the drugs? Well, there's, I'm sure there, there's all different reasons. Um, I know in my case, brokenness, different violations. Um, I also know for a fact there is different family and, and inherited curses um, with myself, my, um, my father, and all different people in my family were drug addicts. Um, so, you know. Yeah, so a lot of times too they say, you know, if you've taken drugs or you're big time into drugs, there's really not a hope, you're never gonna get delivered, you're always a drug addict. But actually, what Sharon has experienced is so amazing. <laughs> we recently went to uh, Florida, to Daytona Beach, where it all started with Sharon. And so Sharon, um, Let's start out actually for the be from the very beginning. How was it that you, you know, got trapped into taking drugs? Well, um, it started when I was younger. Um, just the, you know, d smoking cigarettes and then marijuana was my first thing. I had an addictive personality. Um, I just wanted to feel good and, um, you know, cover up that brokenness from when I was a little girl and I didn't know any better. You know, I, I thought it was okay. You know, everybody in my family stuff drank and smoked cigarettes and um, smoked marijuana. So I thought it was really what I was supposed to do. So that's, you know, where I fell into it at the beginning. And then later on, um, I was, young and I came down with um, what you call shingles and I was only 15 years old. I was in the ninth grade of high school and they prescribed opiate pain medication to me and um, I remember right away I liked it because it made me feel better, took away my shyness and filled that e emptiness in me and um, you know it, it even took off from there like I tried cocaine, everybody else was doing cocaine and I, and I did cocaine too, and um, So you know. tell us, like Sharon, what were the other, say, problems that uh, brought you into going to jail? Uh, well, the drugs, um, just my mind wasn't right. I was under the influence of something that just took a hold of me and I wasn't thinking correctly and I, um, the first time I got involved with the law, I got in trouble, um, was I had um, taken counterfeit money from someone and I wanted to get um, 
the change for it so I could buy drugs. So I did, and um, I got caught right away. And um, the police officer that was involved, the, de the detective, knew, knows my family. So he knew the description and everything. He knew that it was me. So I got caught right away and um, got put on probation for that. And um, I, it was, with the probation, I was to stay off of drugs and, um, and I couldn't. I kept going back to it and I would um, test positive in the urine, the urine test that they do. And I kept getting caught. And um, at that point, that was like eight years ago, and I got into, because I kept messing up, they put me in drug court. Um, because at that point, I kept messing up and they had to put me in jail to hold me and they didn't know what to do with me. So they put me in drug court and that got me out and I went, got into a halfway house and uh, I was doing okay and um, going to drug court. But then, you know, my other, I always uh, was seeking love in that the drugs filled, filled that emptiness but so didn't a relationship. I thought that you needed um, a man in your life to fulfill that emptiness. So I would get into, I got into their relationship and then when that wasn't going right, that wasn't fulfilling, I'd go right back to the drugs again. And I could never stay off the drugs. I just kept going back on it. Um, yeah. uh, and so then um, tell us about like Sabra, the woman that came to visit you and mentor you at the jail? Well, that was, year, that was years after that. Um, I had gotten in trouble again. Um, I was on the methadone clinic because for years after that, after my first jail experience and first time in drug court, um, I was hardcore on the drugs. Um, intravenous, intravenous cocaine, heroin, pills. I would shoot up my own prescriptions. If I got Valiums or Clodipins, I would shoot them up. Um, and I had, I had had my own apartment. I was on the methadone clinic and I was desperate for money. Um, and it wasn't even so much to do drugs, but I, I had no job or anything. I think I was getting welfare or something like that. And I had decided, I took a walk to the laundromat down the street from me. And um, just my mind started going. I had no control like, of my mind. And my mind talked me <laughs> into doing those stupid things because I was under the influence of drugs. And three hours later, there was a knock at my door because I had also had a warrant from something prior to that. Um, so they had looked up my, my name and everything from my license and did a thing and they, they came and got me later because I had had a warrant also. So um, they came knocking on the door and they arrested me. And so I had that on, so now I had that on my record. They had released me. Um, I, in the, the jail cell, I was so desperate. That, that had been years and years of doing drugs. I had lost my children. My family members had my children. I was just broken and I was in that jail cell and I had had enough and I remember I had fake fingernails on and this time I wanted to hide it. I just. I had had enough and I totally believed that God said that it was okay and I, I thought that it was okay to, to die. And I secretly, I had a blanket and I tried to cut my wrist with my fake fingernails. And I seriously really did wanna die. I had, I was all, I had had enough. And um, they had seen me have the blanket over my head and stuff because there was a camera in there and they came in and I was bleeding so they had um, brought me to the hospital and um, they actually, there was 
a thousand dollar bail and they actually dropped the bail and released me so i just kept going on i was on the methadone clinic i kept taking my prescriptions um and then one day i went across the street at this department store um and i was going to to steal some some stuff and i got caught and i was on um probation for that and I had had a warrant because I didn't go to one of the court dates. So that's when I went to jail. And a few months later, that's where I met Saber Stockdale. Mm -hmm. She came in um, to meet me. It was the first time she ever went to jail. I was her first mentee. And um, she came in there. She, I, she prayed with me for salvation. Very, very sweet lady. Um, and you know, when I had, when she had written me first, because she had to write me before she came in, and it was also to get into this faith-based program called Bayside. It's um, for when women are released from jail, they go, and it's, it's, it's godly, it's faith-based. Um, there's a hope, you know, there, it's a safe place, and you can, but in order for you to go there, you had to have a mentor, and that was Sabra for me. So, um, yeah. Well, so she played actually an amazing part in your life. Yes. Um, praying you out of your situation. But that was the other thing. You actually did get out of jail, and you did meet up with Sabra, but I you went south. I guess I literally. <laughs> um, yes, I did. I, I got out. I got into that that house. Um, I had gone to two Saturday nights at Sabra's church. Um, it was music night and I never went to a regular service. And the last night, the last Saturday that I went there, I even said to Sabra, I said, I think that I should have gone to the altar. And, um, but I didn't. And a um, few days later, I had come down with um, pneumonia. And I went to the hospital and they had prescribed me opiate painkillers. And at that point I didn't take them, I actually sold them. And, um, but somehow the people at the house found out and um, I got released from that house and I was also on probation. So now the fear set in and my mind started going. And when all, when all this was going on, the boyfriend that I had before, I had, um, before I went to jail, before I had met Sabra, um, had come back from New York. And um, so I started hooking back up with him and then I started taking drugs myself again. Um, to, but I can remember I bought Suboxone and stuff and it started with that, but then it went on to, you know, buying other opiate painkillers and um, and I had convinced, co convinced and manipulated my cousin that lived in Florida to come pick me up because now I'm scared and now the boyfriend that I had was going to move to Florida but, I, but leave me on Cape Cod and so right away my mind started working and manipulating because I was a manipulator trying to get my own way and the fear would set in and I would do things my own way which wasn't a good way <laughs> and um, so I had my cousin come get me and he had already left and my cousin um, was actually a drug dealer in Florida she would go to different uh, doctors and get prescriptions for oxycodone and um, she would sell them and it was a big it was a at that time she came here to sell her pills, and, um, but she was feeding them to me too. So now I'm hooked back on drugs, um, and then we go, I get on the road to Florida. So now I'm on probation for two and a half years, and I'm running off to Florida. Um, so. so when you were in Florida, there were a few things that actually happened to you. Yes. <clears throat> you actually were um, living on a beach, right? Um, a few times I slept right here at night. Cause this is, it, was hard, it was hard to find a place to sleep because the, 
the beach patrol, when you would find a place to sleep, they would see you and they would tell you to go home. But I had no, I didn't have a home. So I would just move on and we'd find another place to try to hide from them. And this is one of the places that I would um, come to and sleep here and put a towel and then put something else over me, like a sweatshirt over my legs and, and try to fall asleep. Um, before I had chosen Jesus to come into my heart, I was homeless here and um, I would come here to wash off. There's water that comes out of here. Each, each and every circle here, water comes out. It's, um, and I'd come here and get washed off. Well, yep, I had ended up in my cousin, at my cousin's house first, and um, that boyfriend was there, and the, him and my cousin didn't get along, so that caused me to leave my cousin's house, and I ran off to Daytona with him and chose to be homeless with him. And, um, but I got off the drugs there on um, Daytona Beach because, of course, I'm with him, and that was fulfilling, um, you know, that, that emptiness that I would have without the drugs. And at this point, I'm totally sick of the drugs because it's totally has ruined my life. So and now I was putting my faith and my hope in the boyfriend, um, but that wasn't working out either. Um, but we ended up homeless, uh, Daytona Beach. We'd hide our bags um, in the abandoned houses and go walk around all day. And it was the summertime, so it was like, 95 to 100 degrees every day. Um, I came off of methadone and other painkillers right there. Um, now, I didn't know them, but God helped me. Um, he gave me the strength. And that boyfriend um, was what you call a backslider. He once walked with Christ, and he went back to his old ways and his old sin and but he still knew about Jesus and he told me um, you know you're keeping me first you need to keep Jesus first and then I started hearing I said all the because I was addicted to drugs for 15 years and I would try AA and NA and I learned to you know pray to God but I never knew it was about my sin and that I needed to ask Jesus into my heart and I needed forgiveness and I needed to forgive others. And um, that's what I finally got. And he, God used that man to have me turn to Jesus. And um, you know, at one point I was totally by myself in Florida because he left me, he got a chance to go stay somewhere and he left me homeless on the streets by myself. And, um, but. You know, even then, God used people um, that weren't, you know, didn't have him in their heart, but he still used them to protect me. Um, I see now God's hand was on me and protected me from, from so much, so many things that could happen to me. A woman, I, I was 37 years old then, all by herself. Um, just, I, you know, so many bad things could have happened to me and I and I saw some of it but I'm sure there was a lot more that could have happened to me that God protected me from mm -hmm. um, well so Sharon actually uh, your time in Florida you know uh, God used the circumstances to help you out and to really get you on the right foot so to speak so tell us about like the pastor that helped you and brought you back to New England and that whole situation about how you cried out to God and well um, it started I had lived in this this um, rooming house it was roach infested rooming house and that's where I cried out to God to Jesus to come into my heart and um, that's where I found an AA meeting and that's where I found this person that owns sober houses. This is um, my friend Ray, who is actually the house manager at the house that I lived in in Daytona. Um, after I, you know, Jesus had transformed me and saved me, and he was the house manager there, and he was he was my very good friend, and he did a lot of things for me, and I'm grateful to God for him. And she made it. This was my first house. It was a sober house with other women, 
and I was just like so grateful to be here like God totally blessed me here um, when I came here like food was provided from the Red Lobster from Pizza Hut like God just poured out the blessing um, I started I was able to seek God on my own in that house um, God transformed me I got delivered from swearing and watching scary movies and just my relationship got closer and closer to him just by at by staying at that house um, you know other people started watching me too the women that lived there started watching and doing the same things like reading their Bible and praying and you know I would see even some of the ladies going to church and um, because that's what I started doing. I started going to church and because I had this hunger and thirst now and I, I also got baptized right away. Um, the man that owned the sober house went to this church and I, I told him I want to get baptized and, and he said, well, go to my church. And um, so I did. I got baptized right away and I just totally, cha totally transformed. It blew me away <laughs> because I could see the difference of myself and I was like, what is going on? Um, in AA and NA, they call, they talk about a spiritual awakening. And I thought that's what was happening to me. But really, what was happening to me was I was delivered from drugs and I had received salvation. Jesus had come into my heart. The Holy Spirit was in me now. So that's why I had, had changed so much. And um, I had cried out in the middle of the bus station, I just want to go home. And um, about three hours later, um, I was at this church. It was um, a church down the street from the bus station that I had been to before, and I had known the pastor. And now I actually went to church here um, a few times, and this the pastor here. Um, was actually the pastor that God worked through and um, provided the money for me to go back home, back to Cape Cod. He said at Christmas time, and this is February, mind you, um, Christmas time, this lady gave us money and said, there is somebody that's going to need this money. And it paid for my bus trip back to wow, Cape Cod. Wow, praise God. Um, so when I got back to Cape Cod, I had gone, it was when it came to Sunday, I had gone to um, a Sunday night service at the Victory Chapel where I had only gone to Saturday night music night. And um, when I got into the sanctuary, I walked to go sit in the seat that looked good to me right in the front row and I had brought my mom and some other friends. And the person sitting behind the seat I was going to sit in was Sabra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, she yeah. was so happy, so delighted. And I was happy and delighted to see her because I had been, you know, seeking God and start praying for people. Um, and I was praying. She was one of the people that I was praying for. And she was praying for me because when I saw her, she said, oh, my gosh, we're so happy that you're back. Well, I've been praying for you for a year. We had no idea where you were, if you were even alive. And um, that's when I told wow, her God. how God had transformed me, and, um, and she was she was happy, and um, and I also one of the things it was the Sunday after that I had gone to Sunday night and then um, Sunday night service, and then the following week I was there for the first service, uh, eleven o'clock service, and after the preaching and everything. Um, the pastor came off the pulpit after the preaching, after the altar call and everything, came right over to me and he said, I don't know who you are. He goes, but God spoke to me and wanted me to tell you that he heard your cry and this is your home. <laughs> Praise God. And he's Praise got God. a destiny for you here. And that just confirmed, like nobody knew that. Nobody knew that I had cried out at the bus station like that. Only God knew. And um, Man. so. <laughs> wow, that is so powerful. And you know, it's amazing too, because a lot of us know as Christians, people that are suffering in different areas of drug abuse, they're suffering, you know, with substance abuse, even of alcohol, different things like that. This actually, when you do intercessory prayer, this is a form of what they call witchcraft. In other words, you do not have control 
over your mind anymore. You have given it to another spirit. That's why they say at bars, come on in for food and spirits. It actually is you given up the ability to control your mind. So repentance and coming to God is saying, you know what, I am not going to do this anymore. And another revelation God gave me was quite amazing about church. He told me years ago when I first became a Christian, 39 years ago I became a Christian in uh, 1976, the year of the bicentennial. In 1982 I was sewing down in my basement and he told me this amazing revelation. He said, know that the spirit in everyone loves the Father, but it is the flesh that crucifies the spirit and denies it of its eternal happiness with me. So basically what I'm saying is, I've been going to Victory Chapel myself for 32 years, sitting in a church that is preaching the whole entire gospel. Your flesh hates it. That's the only way I can put it. Your flesh despises it and your spirit loves it. So a lot of times when people get involved in drugs because they go to programs, they don't hear the preaching of the word, the spirit cannot grow and overcome the flesh. So the flesh always remains the monster. And so what I'm basically telling you is that you need to go to a church. You can't just quit drugs and say, you know what, that's it because you have to really hope and pray on a wing and a prayer that your flesh is going to be strong enough. And let's face it, Jesus, Jesus himself said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So your spirit is weak. So you need to build the spirit up by hearing the word of God. And I needed to hear the word of God. You know, I was very similar to Sharon. You know, I was a party hardy type. I just wanted, you know, go my own direction in life. But the words that I heard being preached and the fellowship of the brethren, when you're going through struggles and trials, there's other people to lift you up. You're not a loner. You're not by yourself. So you need to find a church where God is really moving so you can grow and stay delivered. That's the key, because people can help you for a while, but then if you don't hear the word of God being preached, there's really not much you can do. So I just wanted to encourage you folks out there. This is a series we are going to continue. We're gonna be talking to Stanley Miranda, who also was delivered from drugs. Very amazing story as well. And I want to thank you, Sharon. Uh, I know Sharon uh, also would like, before we close the cameras, to lead you all in a prayer and ask you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And if you're really, really, truly wanting to be delivered, God's going to do a great thing. All righty, Sharon. So why don't you do that? All right. All you do is just repeat after me. Father God, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. I admit to you that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I forgive all those that have hurt me and I hold no grudge towards anyone. Lead me and direct me all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you know what, folks? If you said that prayer and you really meant it, you need to follow up with Jesus and you need to follow mm -hmm. up with a good Bible believing church. And we do have special services at Victory Chapel. We're at 320 Kids Hill Road, off Independence Road in Hyannis. If any of you out there would like to come check us out, we'd love to have you come on board with us. and. In the meantime, I want to thank you for joining us with The True Zone and hope to see you again next week. And in the meantime, God bless, because he loves you. <laughs>